Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Man. Came to you last time with a heavy heart, and this time I come with just some heavy stuff. Uh, but um, I trust it will be a blessing for us. And uh, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to continue our study of church discipline, accountable leadership part two. This is going to kind of, um, we're actually going to finish it up with this. I don't want to, I don't want to labor too long on this, um, but I, I do want to hit these points. And then I'm praying about where the Lord would take us next, um, looking at justification. Um, we've done stuff on sanctification. We're doing stuff on church discipline, as I've taught. Um, and then I'm, I'm thinking that, We'll go into justification possibly next, but you all pray for me as I, as the Lord prepares my heart for those things that uh, when I have the opportunity he would give me to uh, provide to the flock. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have blessed us with. God, what a good gift it is. Lord, we look forward to um, what you're going to do today. Lord, we're coming to you uh, prepared to worship in spirit and in truth, Lord, with every fiber of our being, that we can uh, enjoy all that you have set, for us, set forth for us today, Lord, for the preaching that is to follow. God, that you would bless the man that stands. Uh, give him unction. Lord, give me the gift of teaching. Help me to be a blessing to your people now today, as you've been a blessing to me in study. And we ask it all now for Christ's honor, glory, and praise. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so... I think it is quite apparent I could give you um, example after example of how important leadership is. Uh, we have a good example of bad leadership currently running our country, but I don't want to be too political this morning, but we just do. We have a good example of bad leadership and where that brings a nation. Um, it's not because there's a D next to his name, because uh, we've got ones that have R's next to their name, and they've been bad leaders, amen? Um, so it's not about that, but leadership is of the utmost importance, not only in the cultural sphere, but also in the church. Um, in the body of Christ, it is of the utmost importance. And in this uh, letter that we're going to look at here in just a minute, in Timothy, we're going to start in Ephesians, go to Thessalonians, and then end up in Timothy. But what we're going to look at there in Timothy is where Paul has instructed Timothy to stay behind in Ephesus, and in that epistle there, he's going to outline the qualifications of a bishop. And that's where we're going to end our study here on accountable leadership, is with the qualifications of an accountable, um, uh, a leader that you should hold accountable by. Um, so it's the purpose, I want you to note this, it is the purpose and not the job, it is not a nine to five, it is the purpose of a bishop to shepherd a flock, and there are requirements laid upon um, not his public life, but his personal life even, of a man who is to hold this office. There are things that are required of him so that he can stand forth and bring the word of God, um, minister to the saints so that he can help build you up in a most holy faith, so he can perfect the saints, all of these things. But this is not a task that is taken on by a man alone. If a man ever by his own it's like Samson. He says, I'll go out as before and shake my flesh. Uh, he's going to fail. There have been times when I went to charged meetings and I said, I know what to say. I know when to say it. I know the intonation. I know the timing. I know, I just, I know I'm going to, I've got some red meat for the dogs. I'm just going to feed them. I'm just going to, I'm going to throw it out there and they're going to just blow up. And then it just blew up right in my face and the Lord left it flat. I mean, flat, nothing happened. I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have got them to move if I pulled a shotgun out. I mean, they would have just stood, sat there still complacent. Um, so it's not the work that a man alone can accomplish. Uh, Pastor Lawson is not someone who has this supernatural ability in and of himself or this superhuman ability in and of himself to compel people. It is a gift that God has given him and he is thankfully using for God's glory. It's not the task uh, that a man takes on alone. It's evident in the words of Jesus that that's the case because what does Jesus say? He says, I will build my church. I will do it. Not, not the preacher, 
not the apostles, not the evangelists, not the deacons. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the Lord uses means to accomplish his will, does he not? He is the potter, we are the clay, and he molds vessels for his work. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to start off this morning before we get to Timothy. Ephesians 4 and verse number 11. I think this is important here. <clears throat> Ephesians tells us that God gives gifts unto men. In verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then I want you to turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3 and verse number 10. And Paul is here, uh, and he's always writing letters with companions. And so when he talks about we, he's talking about the men that are with him ministering. And in verse number uh, 10 here, he says, uh, Night and day... They are praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So Paul establishes something here and he says something that, well, it fills his work up. It fills his position up with work is what I should say. It, it forces him to get to work, to labor, because he says that there's something lacking in their faith and he's praying exceedingly night and day that he might come unto them and see their face and might mature them. The perfecting is always a maturing thing uh, to bring to fullness, in other words. And so he's seeking to add to their faith. He's seeking to build up their faith, to establish it, to mature it. Now, he's not criticizing the church at Thessalonica. That's not what he's doing. He's recognizing that there are some things that need to be brought to full maturity in them as a congregation. But at the same time, I want you to note this. Look down a few verses. This is going to make sense because what we're talking about is the fact that a shepherd, a bishop, an elder, is someone who is to help in the growth and maturity in the work in the church and to help that church grow. But really, the, the, the actual one who brings about the maturity and growth is the Lord. And Paul establishes that here. He does not relinquish himself of the responsibility of working and laboring as an elder, but he makes a very uh, uh, stark point here, a very serious point here, that I think we ought to pay attention to, that the ultimate root of maturity and growth in the life of a congregation is what God does through the man that he has gifted, not what the man does by himself with the people he has been given. Does that make sense? He says it this way. In verse number 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, He, the Lord, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. So note that the apostle places grave importance upon his and the elders work in their life, but ultimately it is the Lord that brings the increase, right? Um, Paul says that uh, one, one uh, sows and another one waters, but God gives the increase. It is God who increases in your lives. Now, he uses means of sowing and watering, but he's the one who actually brings it to fruition. And so, no matter what, our thanks always, even though we are thankful for men, we ought to always be thanking and glorifying God for what he has done through a man and not thanking and glorifying the man. When we give honor to an elder, we are not giving honor to someone because of them, but because of what God has done in them. Because we know that in them, that is in their flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now let me just make it clear, and I think we all know this, but it's not just the elder who has no good thing dwelling in his flesh, but it's all of us. We're all that way. So whenever, here's the thing. Have you ever done something for God and then immediately temptation arose? And then you fell? Immediately temptation arises and then you stumble and you fall. Why do you do that? Because you were glorifying yourself for what you accomplished. You were not glorifying God. 
If, you are, if it is all about God and His glory when you do something for His glory, because that's the only reason we do things, right, is for His glory. Now, now sometimes there are subtle desires in the flesh where we would maybe make ourselves well-known or give ourselves a good name or do something and, and up, uplift ourselves and show how humble we are or show how, you know, just wonderful and holy we are. In, in reality, everybody knows we're not. I mean, yeah, we are, but we're not yet. We're not right there yet. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that when we do things, we do them for God's glory. But when we do them for God's glory, but we lose sight of that, and temptation comes and we fall, the reason we fell is because we were not rejoicing in God for the thing that was accomplished. We were rejoicing in ourselves. Put no confidence in your flesh. In other words... Now, he calls on the Lord to increase their love and establish their hearts in holiness, but he does not separate this work from the co-labor, the work of God, from the co-labor with Christ that takes place in the shepherding done by appointed bishops. Now, there's an unquestionable connection here between the Lord's work and his minister's work. Um, and it's unquestionable. You can't separate it. Uh, God doesn't just supernaturally, without the use of a man, uh, declare the gospel to somebody. He says, how can they hear some, except someone preach? In other words, he uses men. Now, let me ask you this. Men and women, are you open for use? I mean, are you prepared to be used by God? That's what he does. Do you want to see his name glorified? Are you willing to be the one that glorifies his name? We ought to think about that in our daily lives. Are we prepared for use? But we're going to talk about bishops and elders here and, and things of that sort. So Paul, Paul provides, note this, Paul provides both by personal example in his own life and then also in word what should be expected of men who are to be bishops. He does that. Um, now, let's, let's bring it into present time. We're talking about Paul back there ministering in Ephesus. Um, we, we, we remember where he had talked with the elders at, my, uh, at Miletus, the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, and he kissed their necks and he prayed with them. And I, I can only imagine what that prayer meeting was like. We've had some good prayer meetings here, but I would have liked to have been a, a part of that prayer meeting. Um, but um, all of that has taken place, and... We're, we're, we're examining all that, but let's bring it to present time today. Let's bring it to present time today. The past few years have proven that we have an epidemic of unaccountable leadership in the church at large. Is that not true? Yes. I want to say that it's because of these three things, and there are many others, but because of these three things. We have men with vision, but without virtue. We have men with degrees in doctrine, but without discipline. We have men with hunger, but without humility. Those are the three things. They've got vision, degrees in doctrine, and they've got hungry, hunger, but they uh, lack virtue, discipline, and humility. That's what, that's what it is. And most of the people that you see who are falling are men who are lifted up as novices, as as youths as too young and not yet there, they haven't experienced anything. They, they've not gone through anything personally. They went to seminary. They got their degree. They interned for four months and then an opening came open in a church and just bam, shot right in it. They didn't take time and they didn't learn. Uh, now, God does appoint some men to just be thrust into the ministry. God does appoint that. Our pastor is an example of that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with the fact that Pastor Lawson, uh, through the work of God in his life, has accomplished a remarkable work here at Temple Baptist Church and also across the world. But that is not the common thing. He's not a common man. I mean, he's common. We're, we're all common men and we're all of like temptation. But he's not the pattern. He is something unique in particular. Right? But we have men with vision, right? Now, the Bible says, um, well, let me say this first. The old saying goes that as the pulpit goes, the pews go. As the, as the preacher goes, the members go. And that's true. That's very true. Um, and so the pulpits are full of visionaries these days. 
I mean, full of men with great vision, and they've got programs, and they've got church growth books, and they've got uh, their committees, and they've got this grand vision. They're just full of enthusiasm for this vision. Um, you know, that's how men are appointed as pastors. What's your vision for the church? How do you plan to grow the church by 500 members in the next five years? Or by 5,000 members in the next four years? Well, I mean, I can tell you we could grow this church to 10,000 members in six months. We just have to do what the world does. What does the world do to flock, get people to flock? Right? Now, I'm not against megachurches. I'm not, I'm not absolutely against megachurches because there were people also in, in Caesar's court who were wealthy people that God used for his glory. And they helped communicate the gospel. Paul talks about that. During his imprisonment, people get won to Christ who are, you know, they're, they're operating in the world system, but they're won to Christ. And we look at big churches and we automatically think worldly, godless, and this and that, and, and all those things. That's not necessarily the case. God, you know, and one day 3,000 people were added to the body of Christ at the preaching of the word in the book of Acts. It can happen. It is not what always takes place, though. Um, anyways, I'm getting off on a little tangent there. I'll stay away from that. But we've got men with vision, but they don't have virtue. Now, should they not have vision, though? I mean, the book of Proverbs, chapter 29 and verse number 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. So we have to have men with vision, right? But what is that vision? That Proverbs is talking about, there's, there's another part of that verse. How many of you know that verse, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish? Most of us who know that verse know the first part, but we don't know the second part. Let's read it on the whole. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. That's the vision. The vision is the law, in a narrow sense, um, uh, the books of Moses, but in a broader sense, the law is, is talked about as the entire word of God. The vision for a, a people that keeps them from perishing is the word of God. We do not need programs. We need the, we need the preaching of the word, the proclamation of the gospel, the proclamation of the doctrine of Jesus Christ and of the apostles. That's what we need, right? A man that desires to lead in the congregation must be sold out for the Bible. He will not be perfect. He will not be the most upstanding and wonderful person that you've ever met, probably. But he will meet these qualifications. He will. He will love the Bible. And I'm glad to say that we have men in this church, when they stand up and preach, they don't love men, they love the Bible. They don't, I mean, they love men, but they don't love men over the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm looking at some of the preachers. And, um, and I'm thinking about the love that you see when they stand to preach the Word. And some of them aren't in here. Brother Valance isn't in here. And we've got a few others that are missing right now. Pastor Lawson, obviously not here at the moment, but, uh, but he'll be here. But, um, but... They have a love in. They have a love for the Bible that is not um, equal to anything else. You all care more for the Bible than you do anything else. And your care for the Bible informs your care for people. And that's good. That's what we ought to have, right? All right. He must be a man who is to lead a congregation must be sold out for the Word of God. But before he can be sold out for the Word of God, he has to be um, born again by the Word of God. And so I'm going to say this, and this might seem silly to you, but the first qualification of a bishop is that he's got to be born again. And you say, well, that seems silly that you would point that out. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at the statistics on men who hold positions of leadership in congregations across the nation... 
In particular, and I'm sure across the world, but particularly in our nation, the percentages of men who do not consider themselves to be men of faith anymore is remarkable. Atheists in the pulpit, we've talked about this before, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, or a year or two ago, or something like that, I did a lesson uh, talking about men who were not qualified because they weren't even Christians. I think the percentages at that time was, was very small, maybe 17%. But the new statistics that I have seen are around 34% would not say that they are confident in their faith, that they could be wrong. I'm not talking about secondary or third issues. I'm talking about the gospel. I could be wrong about the gospel, but this is my paycheck. So I'm just going to keep at it. They've, um, what is that new thing called? Quiet quitting? They quiet quit. They're just doing what they have to do, the bare minimum to get along, because they don't really care about their job anymore. They're there for the check. Do you know what that's called? A wolf. Because you can't be unsaved and leading a congregation and not leading people into error. You're going to lead people into error, into heresies. Deep, damnable heresies. Right? So, he must be born again. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just simple. Um, with that in mind, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse number one. So the qualifications of a bishop. First off, he must be in Christ. Paul says it this way. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, his apostleship is by the commandment of God. He didn't choose to be an apostle. He was an, a, one that was called out and sent particularly, specifically by Jesus Christ. By the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Jesus is our hope. Paul says, this is the only hope we have. All my hope is in Jesus. Amen. All of it. We are not partially in it for Jesus. We are completely in it for Jesus. Amen. If you are struggling in your faith, you need to look at what you think about Jesus. What do you think about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he all of your hope or are you still hoping in your ability to, you know, work hard enough to put away enough money so that you can be wealthy or you're put it, you're resting in your ability to, you know, just kind of talk your way out of situations or, I mean, you're just, you're just saying, I mean, I'm just going to make it. All of your hope is in Jesus about everything in your life. It all rests upon what you think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we are of all men hopeless. You don't have any hope outside of Jesus. You have fairy tale wishes outside of Jesus. Jesus is all our hope. And note this in verse 2 Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Timothy, as we said, is left at Ephesus, but. He is there as a commissioned man. He is not there under his own orders. He is there under the authority, not only of the Apostle Paul, but of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a man subject to Christ. He is in Christ. You've got to be in Christ. You have to be in Christ. It seems so um, almost foolish to, to make a point of this, but as I said, the statistics are remarkable. Do you know that um, by the year... Uh, 2070, if the stats remain the same, we're going to have anywhere between 35 and 54 percent, depending on which way the stats go, 35 to 54 percent of men who stand behind pulpits um, who will not be confident in their faith if you follow the trend of the statistics. 2070, folks. Up to 50% of the men standing, and there'll be men and women and she-he's and he-she's and all that garbage by then. It's already starting now, folks. You better get prepared. It's going to get wild. Brother, Brother Ronnie Crane showed me something that about made me throw up for a second this morning. I know that wasn't his intention, but I mean, it's true. There are some evil things lurking about in the world. Uh, some of them aren't lurking. They're out in the open having festivals and parades. I mean, they get whole months dedicated to their debauchery. 
Lord, help us. But 50% of the men by 2070, if this, if this trend continues, now these are just professing Christians. They may not actually, obviously they're not actually Christians if they don't even have confidence in their own faith. And they call themselves pastors. But 50% won't have any confidence in their faith. Remarkable numbers. So it's important that we look at a man... And do you have confidence in your faith? Do you know how to know if somebody has confidence in their faith? We inspect fruit. Do you know that you can't pretend to be a Christian long, uh, for a long enough period of time that nobody will see that you lack some fruit? Because you see that you lack fruit. You lack faith. You lack this, you lack all kinds of things that people lack when they, when they aren't really born again. So when you're putting on the show, all of a sudden one day the, the facade falls away and you realize, oh gosh, well that was just an act. And some of you are finding it out all of a sudden and there's people that have been in your life for the past 20 years and they're like, well, they've been professing to be a Christian for 20 years, but I knew something was up. That's where church discipline would play a good role. Man, you got to quit going out to the bar. You got to quit going out and getting drunk, man. No, we, we church discipline those things. You don't just tap someone on the back and say, Man, I saw you out with another lady. You know, that's probably not a good idea. That needs to be dealt with. Or I saw you out and it, you were with a man, it wasn't your husband. You know, what was that about? But we're just so, oh, everything's all right. If we lack accountability, we will lack power. When we lack accountability, we lack power. And we also lack the influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Because the Holy Ghost leads, guides, and directs us into truth. So when we don't follow his lead and guide and direction, what are we going into? Lies. We need men who are subject to Christ. So from this launching pad, understanding that a bishop cannot be ignorant in the teachings of Jesus Christ and of the apostles, we see Paul give the formal qualifications of a bishop and chapter 3 of Timothy and verse 1. We're going to work our way through this a little bit at a time. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, there's two Greek words, and I know that we don't need to rely on the Greek, but it's very interesting at times. There are two Greek words here that are used. For that one word, desire. This is a true saying. If a man desires, in other words, he just reaches out for. There's just an initial reach for it. Um, He has an inclination to say, well, yeah, maybe that would would be good. That would be something that I, I could do, yeah. If a man... Desires, in other words, reaches out for the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Note the use of that word desires twice. And, and I think it's very important, the different definitions of that, and you can find this in a dictionary, that there are two different definitions for desire in the English language, but there are two different words in the Greek. And, and the interesting thing about this is that that first one is a reaching out, like an initial grab for it, And the second word literally means to set your heart upon it. Now, how many of you got a sweetheart? I got a sweetheart. Um, I had an initial desire for her, and then I had a desire that was me setting my heart upon her. In other words, that's going to be my woman. I'm going to be her man, and she's going to be my woman. That was like, it was, it was set in stone like this is going to happen. She's mine. Uh, if I got to caveman it, bonk somebody on the head and drag her, I'm going to get her. 
right? My heart was set on her. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about for a bishop. It's not just a desire that's initial and then fades away. It is a, it is a desire that is initial, but that is fundamentally establishing the heart to a capacity where he can't do anything else. Pastor Lawson says, uh, he said on, on a few occasions, you know, uh, I, with great humility, because this is a hard thing to admit, you know, I've thought about quitting before. I've thought, just pack my bags and I'll go back and be a mechanic. But you know he couldn't do that. Because <laughs> if he could, he would have. Because his desire, his heart has been set upon the office of a bishop and he is relentless in fulfilling his duty as a bishop. He doesn't have just the initial desire. He has the secondary desire where his heart has been set upon it and now he has served for 40 plus years as a bishop. What a remarkable thing. The average tenure of a past year is three to five years. And then they're gone. Then they're going to find some other congregation to mess with. Because they can't set their heart upon anybody. Now, I'm not saying that just because you change churches as a pastor, you're evil or you're wicked or whatever. I'm, I'm, but I'm saying that there is something to be said about men who set their heart upon not only the work of a bishop, but the work of a bishop in a particular congregation. Because in this day and age, people weren't just traveling around trying to find the next church that they could take on. You were born in Thessalonica and you most likely died in Thessalonica. And you knew this community over here, a uh, 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 half day's journey, and this community over here, a quarter's day journey, but you stayed where you were at. You died where you were born most often. That's why it was so exciting when people would pass through town, because that wasn't common. Here, it's tourism. It just happens. But anyways, it's a man who has an initial desire and then a fundamental desire where he sets his heart upon a work. The first thing that demonstrates a man may be qualified for the office of a bishop is his faith, his initial faith, but here in this outline, it's his inclination to it, and the desire is not the prompting of a carnal ambition. If you want to be a bishop because you want to have, well, I mean, I just want to be a bishop, you know, I'm... Bishop T.D. Jakes, you know, I'm like, you, you want the title. If that's all you want, if you want to be the manager of an organization, I don't mean to mix the, 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 the work realm with the religious realm, but, but, but if you just want to be a manager because you want the title and the pay, or you want the title and the accolades, but you don't want to do the work, you're not going to last as a manager. Amen. And nobody's going to like you. Amen. Everyone's going to despise you. So it has to be not a carnal ambition, but it is an aspiration of the heart which has itself experienced the grace of God and longs to see others come to participate in the same heavenly gift. Quote from some guy. I, can't, I couldn't read my own writing. I couldn't figure out what his name was, but that was the quote. So upon the foundation of a man's profession and a continued pursuit of shepherding the congregation and other elders are to judge the man on these marks. So he's got the desire. Now here's the marks. A bishop then must be blameless. In other words, he does not have a laundry list of offenses that he has to answer for. Now there will always be offenses to somebody because we live in a day and age where everybody is offended over something and if you're not, then that's offensive. Because you better be offended. I mean, don't be offended about people like mocking Christianity or anything. Like, you can't be offended about that. But you've got to be offended about somebody's pronouns. Or something, anything. But he can't have a long laundry list of offenses. There's always going to be something. But he's got to be blameless on the whole. The husband of one wife. Now, we know this, that Paul... And this is disputable. Some of you might argue with this, but, but I think that it's borne out just by his longevity in Ephesus. Paul spent three years, in, maybe over three years in Ephesus. You don't stay in one position like that and not be considered a, a shepherd or a bishop. 
He was operating as an episkopos, which is that Greek word for bishop. He was operating in that function. So, so the question is, um, and we won't, we won't labor long on this, but he's the husband of one wife. There's a couple of ways to interpret that. One is that if he has a wife, he's only got one wife. Two is that as a Christian, and this is where I'm going to fall, um, and, and there's some more exegesis that could be done here, and there are men, good men on both sides of the camp here, but as a Christian, he has only ever been to one, married, to, attached to one woman. Because if it, if, if it was the case that as a lost man, everything that you did as a lost man accounted towards what qualified you as a bishop now, then that would mean that you wouldn't qualify according to any of this because you can't judge upon that thing that the lost man, the old man did for the new man. Because otherwise none of this would fit in anybody's lives ever. Because this is talking about a general pattern in the life of a person. So I'm going to fall into the camp that says the husband of one wife means that as a Christian, you have only ever had one wife. From the time you're born again, you have not stepped out on your wife. You have not changed brides. But you have only ever had one wife. And in the same token, if your wife leaves you... Now, get the logic of this. If your wife leaves you and separates herself from you, you're no longer qualified to be a bishop. Why is that? Well, that was her. She did that. It wasn't the man. That was her. Okay, I understand what your objection would be. But here is Paul's response to that. Uh, we'll look down in verse 4, and we're going to hit this in a second again. One that ruleth well his own house. If your wife leaves you, have you ruled well your own house? Because we're to be a picture or a type of Christ to our wives, and... People don't leave Jesus Christ. If they go out from Jesus Christ, it's to prove that we're, they were never of him. That's what John tells us. But anyways, so I'm going to fall into that camp, and, and, and we could talk about it if anybody's got some disagreements, but I'm going to fall in that camp where in Christ you have not been married to another woman. It's a one-woman man in that sense. The husband of one wife, vigilant. You can't be a lazy person. A lazy person does not make a good bishop. In other words, if you're unwilling to work past what you think is, is good work, if you're un unwilling to do as the Lord says, because this is just a general thing given to the apostles, but it's also a teaching that is passed down from the apostles to the other disciples, right? Is If someone asks you to go a mile with him, you go a mile and then you say, all right, see you later. No, you go twain with him. You are, you are vigilant in the sense that you're not lazy, but you're also vigilant in the sense that you are constantly rebuilding walls that are trying to be torn down by the devil. And sometimes that you tear down yourself. Vigilant, you are trying to establish barriers, proper barriers to make a guard in your life. Right? Sober. Now I'll tell you this, that sober does not mean not drunk. Because we're going to get to that in a second. Sober means serious. Someone who is grave, right? Someone who, um, someone who takes serious things seriously. Now I expect that that doesn't mean that he's not the loudest laugher. It doesn't mean that they can never laugh and never have fun, but when it's time to be serious, they're serious. Serious things are serious. Fun things are fun. That's fine. But they're sober. Goes on to say, of good behavior. Of good behavior. We all know what that means. That mean, means that you behave yourself. When you're out in public, you behave yourself. When you're in private, you behave yourself. When you're with your wife, you behave yourself. We know what good behavior is. We yell at our kids about it all the time. Amen? I mean, we're not ignorant of what good behavior is. We know it. A pattern of good behavior in life, given to hospitality. 
the biggest problem with these mega churches, I'm running out of time here, so we're going to be quick with this. The biggest problem with these mega churches is this, that these pastors are insulated against any, any critique and any contact with common people. They're green room pastors is the way that I've heard it said. In other words, they go to an event and maybe they're at a conference or something like that and they go sit in the green room. They're not mingling with the common folk. Our pastor is available. He is hospitable. And I'm sure he is hospitable when people come to his house. He is hospitable there. He's not kicking them in their shins trying to help them figure out it's time to leave. Hospitable, open to people. Right? Okay. Let's hit a few other things here. Apt to teach. Thank God we have a pastor that is apt to teach. But think about this. If you cannot communicate the things of God clearly to people, then how can they come to participate in the same heavenly gift or grow in it? You have to be able to communicate the word of God clearly. Verse number three, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. These are the marks that you should look for in someone who is to be an elder, a pastor, a bishop in a congregation. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that the children are perfect? Does that mean that the children are just the most well-behaved in the congregation? Does that mean that they are, they are the model child? No, that's not what it means. What it means is that when he is taking care of his children, he is doing it in a godly manner, and that his children obey what he says. Now let me tell you something. Your two-year-old is not going to obey what you say all the time. Your ten-year-old may not obey what you say all the time. But you know what is a good mark? If that child, when they get older, you see them returning. You see them holding fast to the things that you have committed unto them. That's a good mark. That is a mark of someone who has ruled their own house well. Now, there will always be children who flee righteousness. The principle laid out is train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is older he will not depart therefrom. He will not depart from it, right? That's a principle. That is not a promise. But the principle in his life is one saying, I'm going to train up this child in the way that they should go so that they will not depart from it, understanding that it is not his will in that child's life that forces them to stay that way, but it is the practice of his life that leads an example for his wife, for his children, that they would be in harmony with his faith. In other words, if there's a man and he's got 12 children and 10 of those children are godless reprobates, he's, not, he's probably not ruled well his own house. Statistically, if he's been doing what he would do before, God does, we're not covenantalists, but you're going to see fruit in his life. And a part of that fruit is conversion of sinners. And a part of that group of sinners is his children. There's not a hard, fast rule on that, but there are principles here. For if a man not know, know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. He cannot be a man who is new to the faith. Can't be a novice. Uh, the primary incline of a youthful heart is to be lifted up with pride. And how many times have we seen a young person full of zeal and um, they got everybody patting their back and they're, they, they seem to be being promoted in, in the mind of the congregation, if not in a literal sense, and then that young preacher, they turn to destruction. Time and time again. Moreover, he must be of good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. When I go street preaching, people do not like my message. In fact, they hate it because they hate the one that I'm preaching about. And there have been times in my life when I have not been a person who has good report because I have um, callously preached to them. God forgive me, and he has, but God help me that I never do that. I have callously preached to them, and I have put them down, and I have, I have put on the, the robe of a shock and awe preacher to, to grab their attention, to force them to listen. 
in a wicked way. I did not have a good report. A good report does not mean that you are not offensive, but that you are not offensively attacking someone. At the end of the day, um, people will come up, at the end of preaching, people will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I, I don't like anything you said, but I really can tell that you are sincere in all this and you're, I believe you love me. And I, you know, I've had people tell me, I had a guy who spit in my face tell me, he said, he, he walked around for a little while longer and he came back and he said, you're still at it? And he came back again and, and he's just watching me, he's watching me and he came up and he apologized to me for spitting in my face. Why did he do that? Because I had good report and he saw and he heard the word of God and it cut him. But if I was out there and he spit in my face and I'm calling him this name and that name and saying, oh, blah, blah, you know, and I'm running him down into the ground and I'm not preaching the gospel to him, do you think he's going to come back and do that? No. A good report of them that are without. Not a novice. Good report. Now, we've been blessed to see a living example of what a bishop should be in our pastor. Uh, we've seen that in Pastor Lawson. But I want us to establish these qualifications in our heart. There will never be another Pastor Charles Lawson. There will never be another Brother Ronnie Crane, Tom Berry, David Valance, Keith Tickell. Who am I missing? David Presley. There'll never be another man, there'll never be another Caleb Wilson. There just won't. So we have qualifications that are outlined that say this person can occupy this position. Now I want you to notice this, that everything that Paul is dealing with here is related to what? It's related to what can be seen in a man's behavior because the demonstration that he has already in the vein of his previous elders' doctrine must be evident. So it's got to be somebody who's not trying to overthrow what has already been established faithfully. If we got somebody coming in here and they walk in and they've got a ESV and they immediately start critiquing the King James Bible and they start telling you this is wrong and that is wrong and well if you would just study more and I've got this degree, I don't believe that would ever happen here. But I tell you what, in 50 years you never know what will happen. Now I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back before Pastor Lawson leaves. And I know he is too. But if that doesn't happen, we have to be forward looking in the sense that while we are looking for that blessed hope, we are not walking in the dark here in time. And so we must know the qualifications. We must know them deeply. We can't have someone come in here trying to persuade people of new doctrines suddenly. Timothy charges Timothy is charged to tell someone to teach no other doctrine. We need to be established in our traditions. Traditions are not always bad. We do not need to be sold out for our traditions. We need to be sold out for Jesus Christ and the Bible, but traditions are good. In 50 years, I hope the Temple Baptist Church does not look very different than it does now except for that it grows more holy. That is my desire. That's my heart's desire. I believe that's our pastor's desire. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you that we do not have to establish our own standards by which we can judge someone who shepherds a flock, but God, you have laid it out clearly for us. Lord, we thank you that we have seen an example for the past 40 plus years of what that looks like, recognizing that no man in himself is perfect, but we have seen a pattern there. Lord, we glorify you for that. We praise your holy name. And I pray, God, that whatever you do in these next, this next six months, this next year, five years, ten years, twenty, fifty years, God, that it would all draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every step of the way, that we would be in subjection to your word and your will and your ways. We ask you to bless the preaching that's to follow now that the church would be edified, that we would be full of the Holy Ghost today. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.